All right, ladies and gentlemen, I've got Lex Hunt on today. We're going to talk about a few different things, but uh, really want to end in bottom fishing because both of us have really started getting into that. He's been doing it for about a year now consistently. And uh, I want to start by getting into your really big offshore day that you had last week because it's one of the most epic days I've seen a friend have, and I know that it's going to be hard to top just based on the quality fish that you got. So what was the goal when you guys left the ramp that day? What was the goal was to catch some keeper grouper. That's what we really wanted was some keeper grouper. Um, didn't matter what kind of grouper, gag, scamp, um, any kind of keeper grouper, that's what we wanted on the boat. We were going to focus mainly on bottom fishing in 150 to 250 feet. That was the, that was the mission for the day. So, you're talking about going out 40 to 50, 55 miles, somewhere in that range offshore. That's where your depth is about 150 to 250 feet. It's, you're almost at the break when you're at 250 feet, or you kind of are at the break when you're at 250 feet. What we ended up focusing on all day was uh, the 200-foot range. So if you want me to kind of – I can kind of tell you – the way we executed everything, if you want me to, because, you know, when you go out, you have a plan and then you have a way that it actually ended up. So if you want me to kind of just tell you how we actually did everything, I can. Well, tell me what the plan was first, because I think it's important that people realize that it doesn't always go as planned. Yeah, well, it kind of did this day. It was it was uh, it actually went pretty close to as planned. So the plan was when we get to 120 foot of water drop our high speed wahoo trolling out so we're trolling for wahoo we're going about 17 and a half 18 knots um we're trolling wahoo all stars um and we're trolling the the double o large i believe they're called that all of ours are big uh squid looking lures so we're trolling those um and we're using 32 ounce trolling weights to keep those down when you're going about 17 18 knots it's important they make 16 ounce and 32 ounce they probably make other ones but we focus mainly i think every wahoo we've gotten has come off of 32 ounce trolling weight so i think it's very important to keep those those weights down so the plan was high speed wahoo troll for about 10 miles that takes about an hour i think Something like that. Yeah, a little, little less than an hour, 45 minutes to go 10 miles Wahoo speed trolling, right? So we're going to drop them down about 10 to 15 miles before we got to the bottom that we wanted to fish, just to cover our ground. And we were trolling through a spot where we had caught multiple Wahoos before. We've caught all of our Wahoos this year, like in a, I don't know, it's probably a two-mile by three-mile square. So if you can imagine like a, two by three square, two mile by three mile squares. They've all come from that area. Um, so we we're going to troll right through where we caught our Wahoos before. Now here's where the plans changed. So we're going right towards our mark. We have a little, uh, I think it's a, it's a tree or a skull and crossbones. We, you know how you can drop different. So we have a mark that's a tree, right? And we're going to troll right through it. That's where we caught all our other Wahoo. Well, Adam looks at me and he goes, I kind of want to bottom fish over there. And I said, I agree. And I trust Adam. I trust Adam's instincts. They're usually right. And I said, look, man, I trust your instincts. Like, that's important for me. When we go out there, yeah, we might have something in our head. But if your instinct and my gut's telling me to do something, normally that's when we, if we follow that, we catch fish most of the time. So Adam says, hey, man, let's, let's turn the boat like a, like a, I guess it'd be like a 45 degree angle. And let's head towards this bottom. And I'm like, all right, cool. We've never trolled through there before. That's fine. It's still in our two by three square, right? So we, we're going, man. We set the rods out. So when we set them out, we can't. We do an eight count and a 12 count or a 10 count and a 12 count. We want them staggered, but we want them way back off the back of the boat. And we're, we're going pretty fast when we open the bale to free spool. So they're getting back there. So we throw them out. It's been about 10 minutes. And, uh. We have changed directions at this point, and we're all just kind of laughing and carrying on. And then, wow, we hear it sounds like a dirt bike, bro. It sounds like a two-stroke dirt bike when those wahoos hit when you're high-speed trolling on those 80 wides, dude. 
it sounds absolutely, I mean, it scares you. It, it scares you when they hit. So he hits, and I see the rod tip going, wah, 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 wah. And I'm like, all right, guys, this is a big one. This might be the biggest one we've hooked this year because I haven't seen one do that before. And it was just like, wham, 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 and it was still peeling drag. So, you know, I get on the sticks, and I'm like, all right, Matt Burrish is on the rod, the reel. And I get on the sticks, and Adam's helping Matt, like, kind of deal with the drag, deal with the wahoo. So I'm, I'm dealing with the sticks at this point. And I start slowing the boat, slowing the boat. We reel the other one up. Sometimes the other one gets hit. So we reel it up real fast, like it's trying to get away from the school of Wahoo if they're, if they're back there. The other one doesn't get hit. We get it up. And I'm like, man, this fish is staying down. Because when you're pulling a Wahoo and, he, and you get him to turn his head, at some point when you get him closer to the, to the wash, he'll start doing what they call the Wahoo slide. So he'll come up to the top of the water and kind of start skipping across the water. And that's what every one of ours has done up until this point right so i don't know like a few minutes go by we get them kind of close i'm slowing the boat down and i'm like jonathan another guy on the boat i'm like take the sticks bro and just turn the boat in a way that we can get the fish away from the engines if it happens so he gets jonathan gets on the sticks i grab the big gaff and i see the fish and the fish stayed down all the way to the boat all the way to the boat and so i knew i was like boys this is a big one so everybody back up when i when I gaff it. So Adam start, you know, once you get to a certain point, you have to hand line that fish in because there's a trolling weight in line. So you got to put gloves on and you got to take the shock leader and kind of hand line that fish in. Well, Adam gets the fish to the boat and I missed the first gaff. Like I'm like, my adrenaline's dumping dude. And I missed the first gaff, but like immediately after I see the fish, I see how big it is. I nail him right in the head with a gaff and he starts going crazy. Right. The fish is like, going crazy and i'm th i'm scared he's going to get off the gaff which probably would never happen but i'm scared he's going to get off the gaff so i sling the fish in the boat and everybody starts going crazy it's a 50 pound wahoo and uh the the fish starts flopping around immediately as soon as it hits the deck slashes my shin wide open dude like it, his mouth you can see it there's a video his mouth opens up, he flops, it slashes my shin wide open. And I didn't know, I looked down, I didn't see a hole in my pants. I had two pairs of pants on. And I'm like, I never thought about it for the next like 15 minutes. And then I'm, everybody's freaking out. And then I, 10 minutes later, I looked, the fish gashed me wide open. So it's important to get back away from those fish when you sling them on the boat. But uh, that's that's what we plan to do. But our, you know, our instincts made us turn a different direction in it, and it ended up good. So... The only other thing we did not do that we planned to do was fish in different depths. We stayed in 200 feet bottom fishing after that. I don't want to. I don't want to like take the whole podcast up talking about, you know, how stoked we were. But we were super stoked, dude. And like, so from there, we were like, hey, we came out here to bottom fish. Like, let's don't go. We could have probably caught a few more wahoo, but we were both agreed. Me and Adam both agreed. Hey, let's go bottom fish. That's why we came. Drove two hours. You know, so we threw the wahoo in the box, and then we, uh, when we were trolling for the wahoo, we saw some good bottom because we ended up in about 200 feet. So we just went right back to where the bait was, and the day was epic after that. I don't want to get into the, the bottom fishing. I want to make sure you don't have anything you want me to hit on. No, man, uh, that, that's what makes the trip special is, is not often that you have a plan and then it, it works out as – you planned on to begin with so having the success of that 50 pound wahoo in the box already kind of makes the day dude it did 100 percent. yeah so you guys are actually trolling for wahoo and you you're looking at your screen and all of a sudden you see something that looks good what what did you see we saw oh you know what we were not trolling for wahoo after we uh i missed this whole part we we pulled ballyhoo for an hour after that so we made it to the break and we started pulling ballyhoo like in the stream. And so you're only going seven miles an hour. So you can really see the bottom a lot better. And uh, that's after we threw the wahoo in the box, we threw our ballyhoos out. We threw our uh, daisy chains out. We threw our tree out. And we started trolling for mahi, uh, tuna, um, whatever would hit, you know, wahoo as well. But we got a couple of short strikes, but we marked some good bottom, like really close to the break, five miles off the break. So that's we saw bait stacked up on the screen and um it was it was kind of right on the ledge but it wasn't like it wasn't any crazy 
it was rocky bottom, but it was no crazy drop offs, no crazy ledge. But we saw bait stacked up, and we pounded that spot pretty much all day, like 100, 200 yards along the break, and uh, that's where we stayed the rest of the day. We got a couple short strikes on the on the ballyhoos, but after an hour, we didn't pull any fish in, and we were like, "All right, time to bottom fish." So we spent the rest of the day bottom fishing. So how did you know it was rocky? Um. You can kind of tell on your screen, like you can see that some of the spots look a little more red, like they look like they're it's hard bottom, like rocky bottom. It looks a little different than the sand, and I think a lot of that stuff out there might be muddy. I think there's some mud, like I'm not 100% sure because I haven't seen it, but it looks like there could be like some different, not sand, maybe mud. But anyway, I can feel it when I drop my jig down, and I could feel like the rocks kind of tangling my jig up a little bit you know that we saw it on the screen but you can more feel it mm -hmm. yeah the research i've done to try to figure out how to find spots is what people will do is actually set your sonar so that it's 25 to 50 feet deeper than your depth and then you see that transition from sand is like a short skinny red to hard bottom is a thick dark red line that's right so that's one thing that I've used to help me for other people that are trying to find spots. That's the hard part is finding the spots where to actually fish. So once you guys started dropping down, were, were you all using jigs to begin with or were you using live bait or? Everybody's using something different. So we had five guys on the boat. I mean, we might've had two guys dropping jigs. Um, I jigged all day on a slow pit try. That's what I went out there to do. So that was my mission to see what I could catch. But everybody was dropping something different and it seemed like everybody was catching different fish on different baits. So I think it's important to see what the fish are keyed in on. Cause if I wouldn't have caught anything on my slow pitch, I would have switched to live or switched to squid or whatever, you know, just, you know, letting everybody drop something a little different. It kind of shows you what the fish are keyed in on and we're spot locked too. So we're, we got a trolling motor, so we're not drifting or anything at this point. We're we're locked into one spot pretty much all day. That's how we fish. We didn't really drift. What uh? So you were fishing a slow pitch setup. What size leader are you running on that combo? I I was fishing sixty pound leader. Um, probably it's a little too light for that depth. I believe. I mean. I learned that later that day that I was probably fishing a little too light. I never got broke off. I never got hit by a grouper. Um, but I think if a grouper would have hit me and I had, I think I got 50 pound braid to, I got a really small setup. I got a pin fathom, the small pin fathom. Uh, I can't remember the exact specs on it. And I got a dial with Harrier rod and it's, it's super light. So if I would have, uh, if I would have hooked into a big fish, it, it probably would have beasted me into the rocks. So the guys that were fishing live bait, what kind of combos were they running and what gear were they using to, to try to target those bigger fish? Those guys were using, gosh, dude, they brought all their own gear. So we, they weren't using any of our gear. They were using, um, gosh, it was bigger, way bigger setups than what I was using. Way stiffer rods. They were using conventional reels, Daiwa. Ah, I can't remember the name of it, but it's 40 pounds of drag. Like it's some serious, it's a serious setup. Everybody's locked down on their drag because if a grouper hits, those first 10 to 15 feet are crucial. You have to gain those, those 10 to 15 feet, especially if that grouper didn't come far away from his home to eat your bait. Because the goal is to get that grouper far away from the rock when he eats because that's kind of your only chance on a big grouper to get him up. But those guys were using 130-pound mono leader, and they were using 80 to 100-pound braid on all their setups. And they had bigger reels than I had. They had bigger rods than I had. And it worked out. Like, in the end, that was, that was necessary to land the, the few fish that we got that were big. And we, we ended up using um, big live bait. So we caught some Popeye mullets in the inlet. And uh, we were like, man, let's just take them out there and see what happens. And we ended up using like nine-inch mullets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a similar situation where I, I went out the same day and fished 25 miles. And I was actually fishing 80-pound. And I learned quickly that that, that is 80-pound leader coming off to a hook is not strong enough for big fish. 
I got broke off like three times. And, you know, the two fish that I did land were probably 10 pound fish. So you go ahead and start talking about a 20, a 25, a 30. You guys call it what, a 32? You got to have 34. Okay. You got to have the gear capable of that. And it sounds like the consensus is it's uh, 130 is, is the way to go for that. So I just bought all new gear and I'm going to re-rig my stuff to 130. Same. <laughs> when you're dropping down 130, what type of rig are you using? We were using uh, what we caught our groupers on and these guys had their own rigs and everything. So they, they, we went fun fishing with our buddies and they knew how to fish. So um, we kind of just, we didn't really give them much influence. We let them do their thing and it worked and we learned a lot from them because everybody has a different style, but they were using literally like a Carolina rig. Uh, it was crimped. So it was a probably eight ounce egg sinker and maybe, maybe a 10 ounce. It was definitely at least an eight ounce egg sinker, which was crimped around swivels and then crimped around their hook as well. So they they had it set up to land big fish and i saw their rig and i was like i really like that rig and i think you should drop a a live mullet down and the guy was like i was thinking the same thing so they were using big like really big stuff yeah Uh, that's interesting i'd love to see that uh like a picture of how that would look Uh, is the yeah is the lead actually on the line itself before the leader or is it crimped like into a permanent section it's crimped into a permanent section, so the okay. the weight cannot the weight will not be able to slide too much because if as soon as the grouper eats, you want to feel it and you want to start cranking. So if that weight slides too much and allows your nine inch mullet, because that mullet's going to swim down there, if it allows him too much when he hits the bottom, like the grouper's going to eat it and be under a rock before you start cranking him. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. How does it change when you're using your artificial jigs? Like what's different about your setup? I, I tie, I tie an FG or a uni to uni straight to my leader. And I just jig with, I don't want, I want to use the heaviest leader I can use without impeding the action of the jig basically. Right. So, um, I, I tie straight from my braid to my leader to my, uh, jig. So that's where it changes. Okay. And how do you go about choosing the right jig for the specific application? Man, I fished. I, the first jig I dropped was working all day. I was catching big trigger fish all day, and I'm cool with it, man. I'm not hard to please. If I'm catching big trigger fish, sea bass, um, big grunts, like any of that, I, I'm totally fine with not catching a grouper. Um, all those fish eat just as good as a, almost as good as a grouper to me. Um, so I dropped a Roscoe jig down. You have one over there, don't you? Yeah. And why do you like this That's type of jig? Exactly. I like the action. I like the flutter on it. Um, you can. You, yeah, that's exactly what I had right there. Yep. So like the way that jig is is uh is molded, it has a really good flutter. When you, when you pull it up, it flutters, and when you bring it down, it has like a. I, I believe it has an action like that. But you can feel it when you pull it up. It has a. And I think that vibration in the water pisses off the groupers and other fish and makes them want to react and strike to it. Mm -hmm. What are some other types of jigs that you use? So I use like these type of jigs. Wait, let me see. There's my camera. I use that. Yep, exactly. I love those. I love the action on that. And sometimes the fish are keyed into those things. They don't want that Roscoe jig. And then I love these type of jigs, these knife or pencil jigs. No, it's, and then I, I try to kind of stick with the, the hundred grams, hundred feet, 200 grams, 200 feet, something close. Like the weight of my jig needs to be close to the depth that I'm in. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I'd never understood until I started doing it, but the reason you go with a heavy weight like that is because you're trying to keep it vertical and you can't keep it vertical. If it takes twice, two, three, four times as long to get to the bottom, especially if it goes down like that, you know, if it's, if it's really cut in one way, it's, you're going to, it's going to be hard to be vertical. That's right. Yeah. And how long are you guys spending on one section with your spot lock before you decide, okay, it's time for us to move. 
Um, so if we don't get a bite within three to five minutes, move. Uh, if we're getting bites, all the good bites normally happen in that first three to five minutes, right? So even, you know, if you get a good bite within the first three to five minutes, I'll give it 10, 15 minutes at that spot. There could be other fish there and they just haven't got fired up enough to go after your bait. But we did, we caught that 35 pound grouper the other day and we did stick in that spot probably a little too long, but it paid off because we had a chum bag out and the mahi started swimming up the bull sharks the cobia started swimming up so it, there were no big there was like one big cobia but we did stick that spot a little too long but it paid off because we put two mahis on the boat so we we're throwing live little little finger mullets at the mahis and they were smoking it i was going to ask you did you guys use chum um do you put your chum out as soon as you hit spot lock or are you trying to fish first or how does that as soon as we hit spot lock as soon as we hit spot lock put the chum out it just gives the chum time to kind of get into the water if you if your chum block's frozen like it needs to thaw out a little bit so as soon as we hit the spot we put the chum bag out and uh the other day we actually uh i don't know how many people is going to watch this and i probably shouldn't say this but it's pretty cool so i want to share it but we we keep an air mattress on the boat a king size air mattress and we tied off to like a 30 foot rope and we tied chum bag to it. So that's what we did the other day. We just sent the air mattress off the back of the boat and then we tied the chum bag to it. And then this huge bull shark, probably, I don't even know, dude, probably 12, 13 foot long at least, started swimming around. He had like eight cobias on his back. So we caught a couple cobias off of him. We were trying to get the cobias back in the water as quick as possible because it was just. It was crazy out there, you know, so we didn't even want to catch those little cobias. But the bull shark started swimming around, then the mahi started swimming around, and it got them fired up. It, it brought them up. So I don't know if it was the boat or the air mattress or the chum or all three, but there was a lot going on by the boat with the air mattress and the chum, and I think that that, that uh, paid off in the end. Yeah. Well, and why, why do you guys try to get it away from the boat? I would think you would want it close. I mean, it's pretty close. It's probably it's probably 20 feet off the back of the boat. So, I mean, if a fish wants to swim to the boat, they will. But sometimes mm -hmm. they'll want to swim to something that's not. And we keep the motors running the whole time. So, sometimes they don't want to be around those motors. If they want to be around like a, like a piece of structure, then mm -hmm. at least we have the air mattress there where we can, you know, I don't know if it works or not, bro. I have no clue, but it's just that something we're trying to. Yeah, it's just something we're trying. Sometimes we'll throw the air mattress off and let it float, like tie a chum bag to it, and just let the air mattress go with the current, and then go 10 minutes later, just go pull up on it and check it. And sometimes it has mahis on it because the air mattress is going, but we're spot locked. So mm -hmm. it, it's just a little trick. I, you know, I don't know if it works, but we have had mahis on it before, so I think it works personally. It makes sense that it would concentrate everything because they feel yeah. that security underneath that and – I know mm -hmm. the the logic is you try to find floaters that have natural vegetation and, and sea life on it, and that's what the fish will get up under and, and target. So that's kind of like an artificial floating reef. Yeah, that's what that's what, that's the that's the concept behind it. Exactly. Yeah. Do you guys carry one uh, block of chum for a whole day, or do you need more than that? We carry at least two, most of the time three. And we're going to start making our own because they're expensive. So we're going to just try to start making our own chum blocks. And there's got to be a cheaper way to do it because I think they're they're not that expensive. They're like 12, 13 bucks. But it can be a game changer, dude. So spending 30, if you're going out that deep and you're spending two hours riding, spending 30 bucks on the chum to keep you chummed up all day, like it's, it's worth it to me. Yeah, you could do it with – any bait that you catch just chop it up and throw it in like a small tupperware and freeze it so it doesn't get the juices in your freezer and then uh, exactly. that's a great idea because they're what are they 15 dollars a block yeah they are we're just gonna get a designated menhaden blender um, start blending them up <laughs> <laughs> hey anything anything you can do to save money is important these days because it adds up quickly when you're talking going out there in the ocean it's always cooler when you make something that works too. Like if you make a chum block that works, it's just cooler than buying one that's, I mean, to me, 
just the craft of it. That's why I do a lot of, like, I use this uh, slow pitch assist metal. It's Spro, slow pitch assist metal. It looks like rope, but it's got metal on the inside of it. Just in case a Wahoo, or we're marking Wahoo down deep, like if a Wahoo hits one of these metal jigs, like, you're screwed if you got rope. For the most part, I mean, I don't think you're landing a Wahoo with just rope. So having some wire in there is... It's, even with grouper, it could probably help. But with those toothy fish like wahoos, like it probably pays off to have some metal. And the trigger fish were hitting it, same thing as everything else. It didn't deter any other bites, I don't think, by using that. Was there anything else you want to add before we wrap this up? Um, I think that the reason we catch fish the way we do is – what we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast, I think that following your gut and paying attention to your surroundings. Um, when we're laying in bed the night before and we have this vision in our head of how everything's going, we thought it was going to be glass that day and it was absolutely not glass. Just things don't line up that you think are going to be the way they are when you go out there, weather, current, um, wind, you know, um, they may not be eating the bait that you that you in your head know they're going to eat. You know, that's why also it's important to have everybody fishing different baits. Going with our gut, I think, is why we catch fish the way we do. And being ready for everything, having free free line hooks tied on for cobias and mahis, they like nothing more than like cut squid or live little pieces of bait. So having some spinning rods with some free lines tied on with the appropriate hooks and the appropriate fluoro. Um, being, being ready for the, when they, when they're there and they pop off, like having a rod and reel ready or a couple of them, if you got a few people on the boat, um, all those going with our gut and being prepared, that's why we catch the fish that we do. Um, and it doesn't always go according to plan and it doesn't always go the way you think. And, and sometimes you have to try stuff that you think is stupid because it's, it could be the difference between catching a mahi and not catching a mahi. So I think those things are super important, like being prepared and being prepared to adapt and change your plan whenever the time comes. Well, Lex, I appreciate you coming on and talking to me about your day, man, and uh, and giving us a bunch of tips about catching more fish. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have anything going on with your roof, hit my man up. I'll put his contact information down below. You may not need a new roof yet, but he can at least give you an idea on what your timeline is, what he's seeing, his expert opinion. So make sure you hit him up. If I can help you with any real estate, my contact information is also below. If you just have a few questions, now is not the right time. Hit me up either way. I'll point you in the right direction and get up with you when you're ready. But thanks again, Lex. We'll do it again. Yeah, thanks, Eric.